Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Brown. I want to thank you all for uh, joining us both here in person and on Zoom. We appreciate everybody's uh, understanding and patience in uh, getting to this, uh, this day. I'm not going to waste any time here uh, as the room we've chosen. Uh, we've done so in order to increase capacity uh, for everybody. But as you can imagine, on a game day, this room also has another purpose. And it needs to be converted prior to the game. So uh, we only have about an hour or so. As far as procedurally, we're going to uh, alternate between taking questions from those of you here in the room and those of you participating via Zoom. We're going to allow a question and then one follow-up per person. Uh, I'm going to be directing traffic here for those that are in the room. Uh, there's going to be two mics available that are going to be roving around. Please raise your hand and we will get to you. Uh, then wait for me to acknowledge you and, and uh, then you can ask your question. Uh, Gregor Buer will be queuing up the questions on Zoom. Uh, please use the raise hand function. Please wait for him to acknowledge you and then you can unmute and ask your question. If you have a follow-up, then raise your hand or use the chat window and we would ask those of you on Zoom uh, to please have your cameras on so those of us uh, here up, up front can see uh, who we're talking to. Um, we ask that you be prepared uh, so that we can get through as many questions as we possibly can in the time that we have. So we're going to begin though today with a statement from the Chairman of True North Sports and Entertainment, uh, Mr. Mark Chipman. Thanks, Scott. Good afternoon, and uh, let me just echo Scott's uh, appreciation for uh, your patience in um, allowing us to have this important conversation this afternoon. As we've uh, seen, heard, and learned, this has been a horrific week. for Cal Beach and all victims of sexual harassment and assault. Hearing Kyle's story has no doubt brought about pain to many people and triggered some very difficult memories. Hockey fans and our broader community have been unpacking the multiple layers of events that occurred in 2010 in Chicago how we're addressing them now, and more importantly, what we will do and how we'll act to improve moving forward. One of the questions that has been asked repeatedly of us over the past week is what have you learned from this experience? As an opening statement, allow me to share the following. First, we need to fight the urge to look to and communicate the logic and facts in our defense of Kevin Shoveldayoff. Instead, we need to be reminded of a number of stark realities. According to the World Health Organization, it's estimated that one in three women will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And according to the one in six organization, one in six men will be sexually assaulted. In terms of seeking support in the aftermath of assault, those who have been assaulted are likely to respond in one of three ways I've come to understand. The first is a preferred scenario where the victim of harassment or assault shares their story with someone and they receive the care and support they need and deserve. The second, regrettably, is one of silence, where the victim does not share their story for fear of judgment, reprisal, shame, or other negative outcome. And the third is one where victims share their story, but those who hear it do not adequately investigate, protect, advocate for, and ultimately care for that individual. Kyle Beach falls into this third care category, who shared his experience and did not get the care that he deserved. Kyle should be commended for not only sharing his story, 
but also serving as a courageous example to other survivors. Now I cannot presume to begin to understand what Kyle has been through, but I have had the experience of seeing the impact of sexual abuse. on people very close to me. I've watched with a sense of helplessness, the pain and devastation, and I've come to learn that its consequences are not self-contained. So I need Kyle to know how very, very sorry I am, and how much I admire his courage. The second thing we've learned this week and throughout these horrible events is that we need to be clearer and more intentional in our messaging. Sexual abuse and violating and others personal space by abusing power is unspeakably abhorrent, abhorrent. Also wrong is inaction by those who know the details and don't do everything in their power to help the victim know that they are heard. I believe we live in a world that is too often not done the important work responding and caring for victims and doing everything in our power to make sure that they and others are not further harmed. It grieves us not only that Kyle Beach had this experience, but that others find resonance in his story. We, we want to name that this has been a hard week for many as Kyle's story is hard to hear in of itself, but perhaps echoes the pain of others who have not been heard and valued. Kevin Sheveldayoff was abruptly pulled into a single meeting where there was a general inquiry about inappropriate texts and verbal comments. He was told by the leadership of that organization that they would investigate it and look after it. He didn't have recurring contact with coaches or players in his role. He didn't know about the harm that had been done to Kyle. He couldn't have known. However, if he had known, the Kevin Shevel day off that I know would have acted and would have done whatever it took to make sure that Kyle received incredible levels of support. That some time was taken to ensure that those around him knew how to support him. That Kyle's privacy would have been protected and that the perpetrator wouldn't have been in any position that would have possibly allowed him to harm anyone else. Kyle deserved no less, the same way other survivors who have regrettably lived this reality deserve better. Kyle's courage in telling his story has inspired not only this hockey club, but I believe also the hockey world and all workplaces to be more aware and to create a culture where people dare to come forward, trusting that their story will be heard and validated. We want to participate in being part of that solution. And I commit to you today that I will use my influence within the National Hockey League to acknowledge that there are, there are systemic problems that will require systemic solutions. And that we will partner with all of hockey stakeholders and qualified personnel to improve resources and programming to both prevent future occurrences and foster a culture where victims of sexual harassment and abuse can safely share their stories and facilitate healing for survivors. Thank you.
Next, we have a statement from the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets, Mr. Kevin Dayoff. Thank you for coming today. I want to begin by stating how sorry I am that this happened to Kyle and that he's suffered as horribly as he did. What Kyle went through is unacceptable and intolerable. No one should ever have to go through what he went through. Kyle was failed by a system that should have helped him, but did not. I am sorry that my own assumptions about that system were clearly not good enough. At the time of the May 23rd, 2010 meeting, where I first heard about the harassment allegations, it was not clear to me what had fully transpired. It was not until this year that I became aware that Kyle Beach had been sexually assaulted. Further, I left that meeting with the understanding that the allegations would be dealt with by those above me. Three weeks later, upon learning that the individual was no longer with the organization, I further assumed that the situation had been addressed. Having had the opportunity to reflect after reading the report and after seeing Kyle's moving interview, I am sorry that I cannot change what took place or how the process was handled back then. But I can learn from this and make sure that this never happens again. Knowing what I know today, I wish I could have been an empowered bystander as Sheldon Kennedy has encouraged us all to be. We all must do better to ensure that we have safe spaces and proper systems in place that prioritize a person's health and well-being to make sure something like this never happens again. We all have to do better. There are far too many instances of people in power using their position to harass and assault others. I'm committed to being part of that change in the game of hockey, and I will speak with and learn from survivors about what we can do differently in our sport. I'll now take questions. Okay, we'll start at the back. We'll go in person here first, and we'll start with uh, Kelly Moore from uh, CGOB and Global News. Go ahead, Kelly. Thank you, Scott. Uh, this first one is for Kevin. You have uh, been exonerated by the Block and Jenner report. Uh, they concluded you didn't know much. But as you've just said now, in the 11 months before you came here to Winnipeg, did, it ever, did you ever consider just reaching out to Kyle, checking in on him to see how he was? And if not, why was the reason for not doing that? Well, unfortunately, that would have occurred to me as something maybe best left to um, those who knew more about the situation, um, the investigation, those that were maybe better trained in, in dealing um, with that, the particular situation in, in involved. Um, with my assumption that the harassment issue was uh, addressed, um, I, I guess I would be, you know, concerned in some regards of uh, violating maybe Kyle's privacy, you know, issues. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I had any interactions with him. He was sent to Rockford um, the next year. Uh, and if I did have any um, interactions with him, they're probably more on the, on the hockey level. Um, but, but I have had some conversations with Sheldon Kennedy um, just recently in and around even topics like that. 
and, and just understanding, trying to learn what survivors want you to say or want you to, you know, to do. At that time, I was, you know, dealing or under the assumption that I was dealing with a harassment type of situation. Um, and Sheldon and I talked, uh, you know, a little bit about that as well. And, and so, I, again, um, if I get the chance, uh, you know, to, to speak with Kyle one one on one here, and you know, in the future, I would I would certainly welcome it. Uh, I would reiterate that I'm sorry that he had to go through uh, what he has done. I would applaud and tell him how courageous he was to have taken the you know the John Doe name away and and made this uh, humanized. And because I think that. Um, he doesn't know the the depth and the breadth of discussions that uh, have you know happened because of that, uh, even in my own life. And um, I would I would say that uh, I would want to talk to him about um, how we can make things safer and how we can maybe work together um, in in doing so. Mark, uh, I may. Uh, good to see you're back, uh, feeling better. Uh, I don't know if you were aware uh, of the negative backlash, be it through digital or traditional media on Friday. Does that concern you about the, a long-lasting effect on the hockey club uh, in continuing uh, the support uh, for Kevin? And uh, I guess the other part of that question is, what message could you deliver to perhaps alleviate that above what you've stated here today? You know, Kelly, uh, I'm mindful of how important reputation is, how important brand strength is. Um, I've, it's been my life's work building this organization. If I thought that for one second, you know, Kevin had ever been untruthful, had ever done anything that uh, I found objectionable uh, if if I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say here is um, I would never sacrifice uh, anybody who I'm fortunate enough to work with for the sake of the what what people may hold as um, a, an appearance and uh, uh, I'm hopeful that going forward people will understand in greater detail now you know this entire set of circumstances but um, if you're asking me am I concerned about the reputation of our organization uh, I was more concerned about the well-being of Kevin and his family, and um, if 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 you think otherwise, Kelly, you don't know me very well. Okay, Gregor, we'll take a question from Zoom. And we'll get started with uh, Rick Westhead from TSN. Go ahead, Rick. You're muted, Rick. Thank you for taking the question. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my first question is for Kevin. I've had many conversations in the last days with Kyle and with the people who are closest to him. And the what I've heard is that everyone, in their opinion, that everyone in that room, that the meeting room that you just talked about, should be paying a price for what didn't happen, for the inaction. And I wanted to offer you a chance to respond to that. Well, um... Certainly, um, I, I appreciate the um, you know the question. Um, I think everyone is paying prices at at different levels. Um, I am fortunate, I guess, that uh, I have an opportunity to be someone that still has a chance 
to make a change in the game and to help grow and learn and um, try to make this a better and safer place so that there isn't another um, Kyle Beach or any other type of situation, you know, that does happen. Um, what we were told in that room or what, what I'd heard in that room, uh, though, uh, again, uh, you know, not acceptable was um, some allegations of, of uh, you know, that, that in, in my estimation or my non-legal um, mind um, was uh, along the lines of, of harassment, inappropriate texts, uh, unwanted uh, advances. Um, and, you know, the response was, in my understanding, that it was going to be investigated and dealt with. Um, had I known that there was any uh, sexual assault involved, I would like to think that it would have rose to a, a different level. Do you have Maybe a follow-up, uh, Rick? Again, uh, my question, second question is for Mr. Chipman. Thank you. I do. Uh, for Mr. Chipman, you, you talked about using your in the NHL. Obviously, our questions about perceived conflicts of interest and real conflicts of interest when a team or a company commissions an investigation into itself, which is what happened here. The NHL runs its own anonymous abuse reporting program. There is no oversight, there is no transparency, there is no accountability. The NHL said yesterday its investigation into Akeem Maliu's alleged abuse was over. His agent later said that Akeem has never received a copy of that complaint and the witnesses that they suggested be interviewed were never interviewed. So who's, we're, we're left asking the question, who's telling the truth? My question to you is, how concerned are you that you may lose the public trust if the NHL does not engage a third party to investigate abuse complaints? Hey, Rick, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I'm just learning now, you know, the process behind uh, this particular investigation and why the Chicago Blackhawks conducted it. Um, I've I've, I've, I've never uh, experienced uh, a process like this. Um, you know, when I was first made aware of it last summer is when Kevin brought it to my attention. And, um, in, and, and so it, it seemed logical, I suppose, that, that, uh, that the Blackhawks, who probably had, you know, uh, an, an awful lot at stake here that they conduct this investigation or, or have, uh, pardon me, a, a third party investigate uh, what had occurred. Um, I can't honestly tell you why uh, th that, that is so. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of regaining or, or, or gaining public trust, um, I don't know that anything we're going to say to you today is going to necessarily um, do that. All I can can tell you is what I'm committed to, and um, and that is being a, a part of a process that says e enough, you know, enough, and. Um, as I, I, I hope you, you gathered through my opening remarks, this is a subject that is deeply personal to me, and, um, and it is to Kevin. And so I don't expect that, you know, that you aren't and, and others aren't going to hold us accountable to what we say today. I can't speak for every team. I can't speak for the league, and I'm not trying to avoid my responsibility as a member of this league. I'm, I can only speak from my heart in terms of 
my commitment, our, our team's commitment to getting, getting this right. And, and so that, you know, somebody else isn't coming forward um, months or, or years from now because we failed them. And that's all I can do. And that's what my commitment to you and everybody who's listening today is. Okay, next we'll uh, go here in person. We'll go to Jeff Hamilton here in the front. Thanks guys for, thanks guys for doing this. Is that working? Yeah, okay. Um, bear with me here, it's a little bit. Uh, Kevin, the basis of the NHL's decision to clear you of any wrongdoing in the Blackhawk sexual assault scandal was strictly based on your position within the organization. You've spoken about kind of not having the power to maybe speak up or not, or at least not relying on others to kind of handle it for you. I'm wondering, you know, your role has been downplayed as a salary cap guy, as a scout, and I just want to bring your attention to an article in October 2009 that says that yes, those things are true, but it also deals with contracts and agents and represents Stan Bowman whenever he's away. And, and then you're quoted as saying, it's truly an assistant to Stan in concert with him. It's something that will just keep on getting defined and redefined as we keep moving forward. You're a sounding board, you're a scout, you're a liaison with the agents, you're a liaison with ownership, you're all of those things wrapped into one. And I'm just curious, why you felt in your position that if you couldn't reach out to Kyle Beach, why you didn't feel comfortable reaching out to your colleagues in management to ask them how they would have handled the case and question them on what happened after Brad Aldrich would have been able to you know, leave the organization? Um, well, again, um, I think it, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, my job, you know, in Chicago was, uh, you know, was a lot of those things. I, I was there obviously to assist Dan. I was there for, for, for nine months at the time, we um, we we had some unique uh, challenges on the horizon with the uh, salary cap, so that did take a, a lot of my time. We we had you know some some scouting issues and stuff like that, um, but you know uh, again, what I know that I, again I was I was asked to walk into um, a meeting that was ongoing. I was then asked if I had heard any allegations or if I had, had you know, known any you know, rumors or, or anything like that um, you know, regarding Brad Aldrich and, and any of the players. I, I replied that I, I had not. Um, my involvement in, you know, in that meeting after that was, um, was not, was none. You know, I, I was basically, uh, you know, I'd heard through some conversations there that, again, there was the allegations of, of the inappropriate uh, texts and um, uh, unwanted advances, and that maybe they were socializing uh, away from the rink, which, you know, again, you know, really shouldn't be happening. Um, so it shocked me, and um, you know, but again, uh, that was limited to all you know, all that I knew and all that I that I know. Um, I, I did not know maybe if other people knew more or anything like that, but I knew that the, the matter was serious and that. Um, you know, again, there's uh, a commitment or a belief that it's going to be investigated. Um, and, you know, to, to you know, the best of my knowledge, when I saw that the employee was no longer with uh, the organization, I, I assumed that, that that process, which would have turned into some sort of, you know, whether it's HR or formal or, or whatever process would have, would have been followed and, and, uh, and happened. So, um, you know, again, there's there's some things that uh, you know you um, just aren't privy to, and you know it wasn't sitting there knocking on the doors every day to say what's what's the latest, what's the latest, what's the latest, because again, um, you know there, there there's processes that uh, you know should have been in place, and I assumed and, and relied that those processes were in place. I think there's a lot of confusion here with. You know whether you're telling the truth or not telling the truth. I don't think anyone's saying you're not telling the truth. You know, you, you grew up. You grew up in hockey before you joined Chicago's Blackhawks organization. You spent more than a decade with the Wolves. You know, you you played junior hockey with Sheldon Kennedy and and Theo Fleury. You know, you, you would have seen 
uh, Sheldon come forward in 1996, kind of putting the whole thing on the map about this thing. It's not whether you, ha you were in a position of power to speak. I think the question is if you felt like you had an ethical duty to follow up on it. And I'm just wondering with all the things we know about hockey, you know, if, if, you've, if you've thought about that either since then or now, and what kind of feelings you have about maybe that responsibility to, to, to like as Mark said, we all speak up or it all empower the bystander. So, so I guess there's two things there. There's, there's what, I, what I knew and what I know now. And uh, what I knew in 2010, I've, I've, just, I, I've just illustrated to you. I told you what um, my knowledge of, of um, the uh, meeting was and, and my involvement in it was, um, was limited to, to being asked if, uh, if, if I had known anything. Since that time, um, and again, you, you, my assumption was that, that, that we were dealing with the harassment. Uh, there was nothing that uh, I learned um, that um, would have led to me to believe that, that an assault had occurred. I did not hear anything like that. And um, assuming that the, you know a, a, an employee not with the organization after it's saying that it was going to be investigated was um, resolution. So for me, that was that was that. I was never you know close with Aldrich. It wasn't someone that uh, I associated with. Some wasn't someone that I you know would follow up with uh, in years later. So you know again, didn't really know his name like didn't really you know bring it up to so you know you fast forward to um you know the the summertime and you start to you know you see this the the civil litigation and um you start to read some of those things and and then um you know you read what was in the um jenner and, and block re uh, investigation and and you know n new issues have come to light uh, 10 years later that certainly um, change things, you know, it, it changes uh, and, and makes you want to ask questions. And, and again, I think I talked to Sheldon, um, you know, about that. I, I, I relayed just what I relayed to you. I talked to him about that. And, and um, you know, that's when we started talking about, you know, his work and what it can do to help uh, today. And we talked about the uh, empowered bystander and how important, uh, you know, it, how powerful and important it has become in his training tools. Um, I spoke with, uh, when I spoke with Sheldon, I committed to um, beginning his online training uh, and, uh, you know, follow up discussions with him after that as to, to, to what level we can bring that um, to our organization. I was uh, talking, you know, to my staff here about, you know, brainstorming about what can we do? What can we do? Can we bring them in for our prospects? Can we, you know, when we have the development camp, can we, you know, in encourage him? Uh, heck, maybe he can even be a guest coach for a day or something like that so that these guys uh, can understand that he's, he's real. You know, he's a survivor and he's real. And to, to help them maybe think, you know, he's, you know, it's okay if ever something happened away from the rink or my life, or if I know someone that is hurting to say to them, you know, I, I understand, I know a guy, you know, that, and, and he's turned out, you know, pretty good and he's doing some things. So that's what, um, you know, uh, I'm focused on. And um, if I'd have known you know, after that meeting that there was a sexual assault, uh, I, I'd like to think that uh, me as a person would have, you know, uh, acted differently. And I, and I believe that everybody in that room would have acted differently. Uh, I've read the accounts in, of, of the other people in, um, in the report. And, um, you know, there's, while well, some level of divergence on maybe some things, I, I don't think there's a divergent on, on what, um, you know, we, we felt, uh, or at least I felt, I heard. Okay, O'Gregor, we'll go to Zoom now. We'll go next to uh, Mike Stevens from the Hockey News. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, this is for Kevin. Um, it says in the report that uh, between when that meeting took place on May 23rd and then to when the Stanley Cup was awarded, 
Uh, there were no conversations taking place inside that the organization um, about limiting Brad Aldrich's contact with players, staff, or personnel of the Blackhawks. Regardless of, of your role or what, how much power you thought you had to speak up in it, did, did it ever occur to you to have a conversation about that, you know, as an aide to, to Stan as well, to say maybe we shouldn't let this guy around these players, considering that these are accusations against one of them? Well, again, uh, I can only rely on the fact that, um, uh, or the thought that um, it was being investigated. And I didn't, I don't know what that would have entailed. Um, and, and again, uh, it, it, it wasn't something that, um, like, it wasn't like we were down, you know, in the um, in the dressing room or you know around the coaches or anything like that to, to understand if, if anything had had been moved, uh, you know, uh, differently. Um, so again, I, I had no, um, I wasn't part of the investigation, so I don't know what uh, what should or shouldn't have, um, you know, occurred during those times. No follow-up, Mike. Okay, we'll go to Sean Reynolds at the back, please. Thank you. Um, kind of on on the point of what you were just speaking about, in that time where Brad Aldridge is still part of the team to the point that he's on the ice with the rest of you celebrating that cup, um, regardless of what you knew about the investigation, you knew that in that critical time, nothing had been done with him. He was still part of the team. So why assume when he's still with them at that critical time, why assume that it was going to be taken care of or it was taken care of when by all looks from the outside, it hadn't been taken care of at an extremely crucial time? Well, again, I wasn't part of the investigation, so I don't know if, if uh, you know, I, I guess I, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know if there had been discussions. I don't know if there had been um, certain things. And, um, you know, again, it's, 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 it's hard to speculate for me uh, as to uh, what should or shouldn't have happened in that process when I wasn't in, involved in that process. I'm not asking you to speculate here, but um, uh, Mark had said that the Kevin Sheveldayoff, he knows, would have done something about it. You've said you know you would have had the, like the opportunity to act different had you known the full scope of the situation. What would you have done? Uh, I'm sorry. So what? Uh, what was the question again? The, que the question is, had you known back then the full scope oh, of what had happened, what yes. would you have done at that time? Well, again, uh, I think in, in responding even you know, to Jeff's there, if, if I had known, you know, again, if there was an understanding that it was a, there was a sexual assault, I, I believe that you know, it would have been handled much, you know, much differently. And certainly, um, you know, the Kevin Sheveldayoff that's here today, you know, definitely would have, uh, would have handled it. Uh, uh, you know, if, if, if we find out that there's an assault, um, you know, if we find out there, there's uh, there's a harassment, we're we're going to put um, you know we're going to ensure that there's you know policies and procedures that that are in place for um, you know swift thing. You know, one thing I obviously what happened uh, you know a couple of days ago. Um, I was just before I was heading to you know to New York. Um, I met with the players. I met with the team. We were in L.A. at the time. And um, you know, I talked to them. I said that I was flying to uh, to New York to uh, to meet with the commissioner, and um, you know, I said that there's uh, um, you know there was a report out there that that they should uh, you know should uh, um, you know read it, and and I, and I believe at the time the um, the video was out there as well, and and uh, encouraged them all to watch it. And I told them, I said that my goal, my desire, um, I guess I actually I told them more. I said, you know, like if we want to have a discussion about anything going on right now, we certainly can. I'll give you the opportunity to raise, answer questions in front of you right now. Or, you know, if you want to pull me aside privately, I'll, 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 uh, I'll answer them one on one. Um, you know, or, or if you don't feel comfortable, I understand. Um, but I said, I want to talk to you more about um, what, what kind of organization that I hope we are. Um, having and that if we if we are not if we're not reaching that type of level please let me know I said I wanted an organization that was inclusive in all aspects of things I wanted an organization that um, you know no matter what uh, you know race you were what uh, sexual orientation you were what um, 
uh, what you believed um, th that you know you should feel free and safe to you know to to, to be uh, a part of it and, and and never feel excluded. I said I want an organization where you you know where you feel you're safe, whether it's um, you know wh whether you're safe from each other, um, from a, whether it's bullying or harassment. Um, or whether it's um, you know that you think that uh, it's a coach or a manager or a trainer uh, or, or anyone associated you know around you, you should you know you should feel safe, safe to speak up, uh, safe to uh, ask a question, safe to um, uh, you know that there's 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 not going to be reprisals. And I, you know we talked about the different methods that that are that are out there, whether it is bringing it to a coach or a manager. Or whether it's bringing it to you know the the NHL or the PA or the hotline, um, but bring it. Don't don't hold it in. And um, you know at the end, uh, you know a lot of guys, um, you know they, they they applauded and, and I left and I got some private texts after, um, you know from some of the guys saying thank you for you know for for saying that, and. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, wishing me, you know, good luck in, in, in my, uh, in my quest. So that's the, you know, the organization that, um, that I want to build here. Okay, Gregor, we'll move to uh, zoom. Go next to Josh Clipperton from the Canadian press. Go ahead, Josh. Kevin, uh, you released a statement, uh, through the team in the summer where, where you said you had no quoting here and you had no knowledge of any allegations involving Mr. Aldrich until Asked if I was aware of anything just prior to the conclusion of his employment with the Chicago Blackhawks. After confirming that I had no prior knowledge, I had no further no no prior knowledge of anything. I had no further involvement. Like that, that's clearly not true, given the report and what's come out, including your attendance at the May 23rd meeting. Can you can you give an explanation for that that well, statement? You need to look at the context of when that statement um, was released. Um, at that point in time, there was. Um, a, 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 a meeting, I guess, that was said to have happened in San Jose, where um, this, the, you know, if, I, I think if you look back at the timelines, that's where they um, started talking about that there was a, a meeting with uh, Paul Vincent and, um, you know, several of the uh, executives that, that were, were named there. Um, people started asking if I was, you know, part of that. And um, you know, I was not, and, and clearly um, that happened, or that alleged meeting happened uh, before this meeting uh, that did occur. Um, you know, on the uh, on the 23rd. Um, so there was obviously litigation involved, and, and um, I, you know, again, I wasn't in a position to be introducing, you know, new facts, of, you know, about a, a meeting that um, that I knew of. Um, so there's nothing false. Uh, or inaccurate in that statement uh, at all. I was never and have never had any meetings with uh, Paul Vincent uh, regarding this matter. Um, and um, so I was not, uh, in, and, and again, I think if you read the report, uh, I, you know, the, the, the meeting itself is, is talked about uh, in, that, uh, in that report um, from the investigators. Um, so I needed to try to say a bunch of things without being able to um, say that there was a, a meeting that happened um, in Chicago that I, you know, the, that, that obviously I, I've, I've referenced. Um, after that, I did not have any involvement, uh, was not part of, uh, of the investigation. And, um, you know, three weeks later, this, uh, uh, this person was no longer uh, part of the organization, and um, I was not. Uh, privy to how that separation even transpired. So, well, maybe it was a little wordy and a, and a little bit curvy. Um, it was 100% true. Okay, we'll go in person here uh, to Scott Billick there at the back. Uh, Kevin, if, if you had this situation come up now, um, let's say even a Brad Aldrich situation where you hear just a little bit, would that person be allowed to be with the team for the next three weeks, month, whatever it is, during an investigation, or would that person be put on leave at this point? 
So first and foremost, um, we're going to do our best that there is never a situation like that, and that's why we're going to educate and talk and uh, try to incorporate uh, learning into, um, into something like this. But I do, um, I, I would like to think that because of that learning, we, uh, we, people would feel free to come forward if, if in fact that they um, did have that. And what I would do is I would immediately um, go to Mark. Uh, I would immediately then, uh, we would immediately go to our HR and, and probably involve our, our, uh, our internal legal counsel uh, and to follow the policies that, uh, that are in place, um, you know, with our HR. And, um, uh, you know, I believe, you know, that, that person would be um, separated upon investigation or uh, pending the investigation and uh, that the privacy of the people that, you know, whether it, whether it was firsthand or secondhand, certainly, um, you know, would, uh, um, would be of the utmost importance. Just one for Mark. Um, have you canvassed the people in your organization, especially in the hockey side of it, that have worked in hockey a long time, to see if they have not reported um, a situation in the past? Have I spoken to everybody in our hockey organization? No, I haven't. Um, do I feel like we have the level of trust in our organization right now that would cause any any member of our hockey department and and I would I would stress beyond that uh, the rest of our organization. I think it's dangerous to focus this just on hockey players and coaches and trainers. This is a workplace issue, okay? And, you know, in, in order to be successful in any business, and this may sound, I don't know, you, you, you cannot have any, any level of success without a culture that's built on trust, okay? You can't win hockey games. You can't, you can't do anything if, if people don't trust one another. I'm really proud of the culture that we've built here over the last 25 years. I'm extremely proud of it. I'm extremely proud that there is a survivor that works for us, okay? And it has for a long, long time. So I don't feel the need to go player by player, coach by coach, trainer by trainer, and ask them because I honestly believe in my heart they'd tell me. Um, I'm not separated from anybody in our organization through layers of hierarchy. Uh, this is what I do for a living. And I care very, very deeply about our players, but I also care very, very deeply about the other 260 people that work for us. I, I, I like to believe they know how much I care about them and that we have built a culture on trust. So no, I haven't gone to each and every one of, you know, and, and, and asked them if there's something they need to tell me because I think they would. And and they have. You know, it may not be as something as, it, as difficult and as challenging, as horrific as what Kyle's gone through, but there have been lots of instances over the past 25 years, and even more recently, where people who are in our care and employ have had a significant personal challenge, and they've come to us. If not to me directly, to people in the organization that they know they can trust and that I, whom I trust. So I don't think we're starting from ground zero, Scott. I really don't. I mean, I think, and I don't want to give you the impression that I think we've got this all figured out, because clearly we don't. And there's, you know, in life and in business and in, you can always learn and get better. And that's what this is for us right now, is getting better, you know? Um, I don't want to over-personalize this, I really don't, but, you know, I, t I talked to, 
Sheldon, poor Sheldon is getting inundated, but you know, we're the last team he played for. I don't know if you know that, but he, we're the last team that, that he played for. And, and there, there's a reason for that. You know, that was in the late 90s. It was just a couple years after he came forward so bravely. And, uh, and I think it was shocking, right? Back then, this was a subject that was far more stigmatized than it, than it is today. It's still far too stigmatized. But the courage that he demonstrated to me was mind-blowing. And, you know, Zinger and I at the time, I recall saying, you know, what if? Um, what if when he's ready, we could, we could let him play the game again? And what if maybe that could be a source of healing for him? Because he loved, he, you know, he, he, like all these kids, they just love to play the game. It's, it's all they know, right? It's, it's, what, it's, it's all they've known since they were four, five, six years old. And so I remember on a Saturday afternoon talking to Sheldon and, and offering that opportunity. And, and I'm, I'm so glad we did because, I, you know, I learned a lot from that. But the thing that really sticks in my mind about all that was how he walked into a locker room of a bunch of guys that he didn't know. He knew a couple, but because everybody knows somebody. But how warmly he was embraced by his teammates, you know. And there was a, there was a learning in that for me, and uh, um, and you know, and a relationship developed from that that I'm so thankful for, blessed for, and uh, and to be able to rely on him so many years later has really, really been helpful. Um, these are really un uncharted waters, and we're trying to navigate them as best we can, trying to do the right things. We, always, we, we, we don't always get it right, Scott, but we try to do the right things. And, um, and so I'm sorry that's such a long answer to your question, but I don't, I don't feel the need to, to ask any, each and every one of the many hundred that work for us, but I honestly believe if they felt threatened, if they felt unsafe, I, they would tell somebody and I would know about it. Go ahead, Gregor. Go back to uh, Rick Westhead from TSN. Go ahead, Rick. I hope you can hear me. I've unmuted myself, Mr. You're Chipman. Good. Mr. Chipman, I wanted just to follow up on my question to you because I'm not sure Either I maybe I didn't do a great job of, of asking it, or maybe I didn't quite get your answer. Um, but when it comes to independent third uh, third party report, uh, investigations, we heard the, uh, the, about this topic yesterday when the NHL gave its press conference. And I just wonder if you were not a hockey team owner, just a hockey dad watching this, and you heard um, some of the comments from Gary Bettman about the fact that Sheldon Kennedy's abuse wasn't at the NHL level, that the 16-year-old player who was sexually abused by Brad Aldrich um, and Brad Aldrich was, was convicted of that offense, that Gary Bettman needs more information before he can make a promise to offer counseling for that family. Knowing full well that that boy is probably watching the press conference and dodging the question of whether you know we need a third-party investigator to handle these things, what would your impression of how the NHL handled that press conference yesterday be? Well, first of all, I'm sorry. I didn't understand your question. You broke up a little bit, Rick, and so I apologize if I didn't answer it properly. I wasn't trying to avoid it. Um, I am a hockey parent. And um, I think that the game of hockey, from the highest level, um, And at every, at every point, um, has an obligation to the well-being of the children and the young men and young women that play it. So, I, 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 I don't know exactly the words that were used yesterday, and I'm sorry, um, but I, I can't imagine that anybody that I'm. Uh, that I'm 
that, that feels any differently about that than what I just articulated. Uh, that, that family in Michigan, you know, I, I said in my opening remarks that sexual abuse is never self-contained. It, 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 it's not an isolated incident that gets sealed up. It has incredibly devastating and long-reaching implications as appears to be the case here. So it's not enough for us to say that we're grieving what happened to Kyle. It's, it's, not, a, it's not enough. It, and it, but it's, it's also not enough to limit this to, to people that have been affected by sexual abuse inside of hockey. This isn't, you know, I mean, we're talking about it because it happened inside our world, but it's by no means limited to what's going on. So I, I think we've just got to learn to be far more attuned to the reality of it and to be far more sensitive to the impacts of it. And um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm hopeful um, that our league will take a, a lead in, in doing just that. I, 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 I believe in my heart we will. And uh, as I said, you know, I, I can't speak for, for everybody that's involved in this game, but I, I, I believe that this can be a moment where we say enough and, um, and we don't just um, isolate or, or, or focus on, one, on a victim as horrific as it has been. We, we need to be mindful of how widespread, how pervasive, and how abhorrent um, this conduct is in our society. Okay, guys, unfortunately, we only have time for two more. We've got one more here in person and one more from Zoom. So in person, we'll go to Mike McIntyre. Kevin, uh, we've talked a lot about Kyle Beach, and of course, he's put kind of a face to this as a victim and courageously coming forward. But Mark just mentioned um, the 16-year-old boy in Michigan. And of course, there's another Blackhawks player who I know hasn't come forward but uh, is the the idea here that obviously Brad Aldrich once he departed the organization did go on to um, victimize another young man and so knowing what we now know ultimately became of this case I mean is there a feeling that everyone in that room um, regardless of maybe what they knew at the time that that more could have or should have been done to prevent him or to to alert others that he went on to work for about what was perhaps coming their way um, so again I, I can only I guess speak to, to what I knew then um, and uh, you know again I've, I've Certainly, um, what you know now is is something that is that is heartbreaking, and um, again, it's hard to put the two together uh, because the emotions um, are are very you know very very different. Uh, obviously, now we have the uh, ability of time, and we have uh, obviously. Um, Kyle coming forward after you know the the different steps and processes and all the information that we have now that we couldn't have known at the time or at least I couldn't have known I didn't know at the time it, it's hard to um, to sit here and say oh you, you, maybe maybe you could but you didn't know and you when you don't know it, um, Again, it's hard to to put it into words, but um, when something, I guess, based on the information that you have in front of you, um, is 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 taken to the point where um, you know you believe 
that the processes that you thought were taking place took place. It, it's hard to sit there and think, I guess, okay, you know, did, uh, uh, did, the, did the right outcome not happen? But certainly what we know now, um, it, it's heartbreaking and it's, uh, it's, it's something that um, I think that's why we were, we're here talking. Uh, I think that's why we're here having the, the communications that we're having, the, the, the hard conversations, the um, planning, training that we're hopeful to impart either within our organization or you know, not, not just within our, our hockey teams, but our, our business staff and that so that um, this never happens again. Um, that's all I can control. I can't control what, what happened back then. I can't control what I knew. Um, and I, again, when I started reading this summer about the different things, uh, it's emotional. Like, and, and, um, and again, I, I, I'm sorry Kyle had to go through that. And, um, yeah. on on uh, you talked about the culture and the culture of trust it, it strikes me that chicago has always been a franchise since you guys located here that you've tried to model a lot of things after the blackhawks and look at the on ice success three cups i mean they they seemingly accomplish it all but i just wonder now what we've learned about the blackhawks specifically around that time there was obviously other things going on, uh, not a very positive culture, but one of the overriding elements of this report was that it was a win at all costs, that, you know, it was, uh, and I just wonder how you reconcile that, a franchise that you no doubt looked at with, you know, envy in a way, and tried to model this one after to what we've now learned about that franchise. Um, yeah, Mike, it would have been hard not to be envious of the, uh, the on-ice success that the Chicago Blackhawks, uh, enjoyed. Um, I thought about that. I've been thinking about that. Um, you know, um, This is a, it's a harsh, harsh business, right? It's about winning and losing. We get, we get judged every day on how we play the night before. And that's fair, right? That's, that's, that's what this is all about, or seemingly. You know, um, and, and I, 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 I assure you, I mean, nothing would, would, would bring me greater joy than um, seeing this community um, enjoy a championship, right? Um, when we got in this business 25 years ago, it was it was really just to keep the game going after a really uh, you know difficult process of losing our team and seemingly our identity and and so. You know, we, we began this pursuit of seeing if we could bring the, the league back to Winnipeg. But, it might, you know, what I learned through the process of, of losing the team wasn't about winning and losing, you know. It was how much the team meant to this city. And that's what, that's what kind of, you know, I remember talking to my father about it, saying, like, Maybe someday you'll be lucky enough to win, you know? Although 32 teams, you should win it every 32nd year now, I guess, if things were fair, but this is not a fair business. So I didn't get into this with the express purpose of, you know, we're gonna win um, and, and we're gonna sacrifice the, the principles that I was brought up on in order to do so. like. The win was the win was and is um, the joy in in having this beautiful game played in our city. 
right? I don't want, I don't want you to mistake what I'm saying here, that I, I'm not trying to win. And uh, anybody who knows me uh, or grew up around me uh, knows how competitive I am and, and, uh, and how much I, you know, I, uh, how, how much I, we try and do everything we can to create the conditions that allow us to win. But the real joy in, in being a part of the league and the real joy for me in taking away the, or taking the edges off that harshness that I'm, is, is the meaning that this game has to people here and the impact that this game has allowed us to have in our community. You know, um, I know we're running on here, but you know, we we uh, we we lost a really special player, and to to uh, to uh, a player that had played for us, and I know you know who I'm talking about. And it would have been easy for us to do a puck drop and run a highlight reel and have an emotional few moments to celebrate Rick Rippon's life. But that would have really cheated him. And it would have cheated those who work for us who loved him deeply. And so what the game, what the team, what, what it's allowed us to do is to build something of substance around his life and honor his life. And we've done that. You know, we, we employed full-time three school teachers and wrote a set of resources for the public school system that 65,000 students benefited from last year in a 15-week program, right? That's the stuff that, that gives all of this meaning. Now we have the opportunity to do that again. Now we have this this crossroads that anybody with any sense of humanity is sh has been shaken by. And now we can do something about it. And that's what we're gonna do. And so, sorry if that doesn't answer the question. Absolutely, I, nothing would give me greater joy than seeing the people who have supported us be able to celebrate a Stanley Cup, but it, it'll never, ever, 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 ever be at the expense of, of, a, of a human being, ever, obviously. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm really hopeful that with Kevin's leadership and support and the rest of the people that I'm so fortunate to work with that this is a subject that we can really embrace and 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 lead on and um, and make a difference on and uh, and that's the way we'll honor Kyle and that's the way we'll honor um, the people that that uh, that I know and love and the countless others that have remained anonymous and unnamed and don't have the courage yet to tell their story. Okay, uh, unfortunately, uh, and I understand there's a lot of you that have questions, but unfortunately we've run up against a, a bit of a time, uh, a time situation here with the facility that we're in. I, uh, I do apologize again for those of you that I know that wanted to ask a question. Um, I do thank all of you for coming. I do appreciate, as I said at the beginning, your understanding and your patience in allowing us to get to this day. Uh, I think we all recognize that it, it was an important moment and uh, an important discussion that we have to have. So I thank you for coming. I thank those of you for participating in Zoom. Again, I apologize if you wanted to ask a question and we didn't get to it, but uh, we do uh, appreciate your time and thank you for participating. Thank you very much.